Welcome to our latest video, which has the title Using Kinetics to Understand Reaction Mechanisms. This video is suitable for A-level students. By the end of this video lesson, you should be able to explain the meaning of the term rate determining step and understand how kinetics data can be used as evidence to support proposed reaction mechanisms. You should also understand that catalysts increase the rate of a reaction by providing alternative routes or mechanisms with lower activation energies and be able to explain this using the Arrhenius equation. Now in our previous videos, we've looked at the rate equation and the Arrhenius equation. And the Arrhenius equation can be written as K is equal to AE to the minus EA over RT, where K is the rate constant, A is the frequency factor, which is related to the frequency of collisions between particles, and EA is the activation energy, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Now if we look at this expression, E to the minus EA over RT represents the fraction of molecules present in a gas which have the energies equal to or in excess of the activation energy at a particular temperature. Now A is the frequency factor, sometimes referred to as the Arrhenius constant, and it varies from reaction to reaction. And this factor is related to the frequency of collisions between particles, and it varies slightly with temperature, although not too much, and therefore it can often be taken as constant across small temperature ranges. Now collision theory tells us that there are two ways of increasing the rate of a reaction. You can either increase the frequency of collisions, and that's what happens when you increase the concentration of reactants, and the second way that you can increase the rate of a reaction is increasing the percentage of particles with energies equal or greater than the activation energy. Now if you increase the temperature, that's what happens. You increase the percentage of particles with energies equal or greater than the activation energy. Now catalysts increase the rate of a reaction by providing alternative routes or mechanisms with lower activation energies. Now remember the activation energy is the minimum amount of energy required for a reaction to start. And a mechanism is a description of the series of steps that occur during a chemical reaction. Now the Arrhenius equation helps us to understand why catalysts increase the rate of a reaction. Now catalysts increase the rate of a chemical reaction by providing alternative routes or mechanisms with lower activation energies. And this does not affect the concentrations in a rate equation, so it is the rate constant that is changed when you add a catalyst. Now if we study the Arrhenius equation, K is equal to AE to the minus EA over RT, where K is the rate constant, a is the frequency factor, EA is the activation energy, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature, we can see that reducing the activation energy increases the value of E to the minus EA over RT. And it's this part of the equation that represents the fraction of molecules which possess the activation energy, or greater, and hence therefore increases the rate constant. Now it should be no surprise that if you lower the activation energy, a greater fraction of molecules will therefore possess the activation energy or greater. Now the following exercise should help you understand what happens when there is a lower activation energy for a reaction. So we want you here to work out the value of E to the minus EA over RT, which represents the fraction of molecules which possess the activation energy or greater. And we want you to do this for two different values of activation energy. So value one represents the uncatalyzed reaction and it has an activation energy of 157,000 joules. And value two has an activation energy of 100,000 joules because of the presence of a catalyst. Now we want you to work out 
the fraction of molecules which possess the activation energy or greater for both values. So pause the video, read for the question, have a go at the question, and then we'll go for the answer. So here we have to work out the value of e to the minus ea over rt for two sets of data. And all that's changing here is the activation energy because of the presence of a catalyst. So if I do this for the first set of data, I have e to the minus 157,000 because that's the value of activation energy in joules divided by 8.314, the value of R, times 600, which is the temperature in Kelvin. Now this can be simplified as E to the minus 31.47. So if I work out what E to the minus 31.47 is, I get a value which is equal to the fraction of molecules which possess the activation energy or greater, equal to 2.152 times 10 to the minus 14. Now value two, for the activation energy is 100,000 joules. So this is a lower activation energy. And if we plug this data into the formula E to the minus Ea over RT, which represents the fraction of molecules which possess the activation energy or greater, we will get a new value for this fraction. So let's put these numbers in. E to the minus 100,000, because that's the new activation energy in joules, divided by 8.314 times 600. Now that can be simplified as E to the minus 20.047. And if I put that into the calculator, that gives me a value for E to the minus Ea over RT, which represents the fraction of molecules that have the activation energy or greater of 1.968 times 10 to the minus nine. Now notice that 1.968 times 10 to the minus 9 is a bigger value than 2.152 times 10 to the minus 14. And this means that lowering the activation energy means that you have a greater fraction of molecules that possess the activation energy or greater. And that's why you have a faster rate of reaction. So now we're going to move on to look at the meaning of the term, the rate determining step. Now reactions are often much more complicated than a chemical equation suggests. For example, they'll often take place in a number of steps and the term mechanism is used to describe these steps. Now all the steps in a mechanism combine to form the overall equation. Now you've seen in organic chemistry, a reaction that looks relatively simple for example, methane reacting with chlorine to form chloromethane and hydrogen chloride gas is often much more complicated. That reaction contains initiation steps and propagation steps and termination steps and is quite a complicated mechanism. But the chemical equation suggests that it's a very simple reaction. Now, each step in a mechanism will occur at a different speed. And the rate of a reaction is heavily dependent on the slowest step. And it's the slowest step in a reaction, which is called the rate determining step. Now the rate equation is always based on the slowest step, this rate determining step. And the following diagram shows reactants A and B reacting together in a series of steps to form the product G. And in step one, a reacts with B to form products C and D. And this is a really fast step. It just takes a minute. And C and D react to form the products E and F. And this step is much slower and takes three hours. And then E and F react together to form G. And this takes about 10 seconds. Now the rate determining step here would be step two because it's the slowest step. Now obviously this reaction, which takes place in a series of steps, takes a total of three hours, one minute and 10 seconds. And you can see that really the step that determines the rate of this reaction is step two, because that's the slowest step here. That's the step that determines the rate. And it's obvious why the rate equation would be based on this step, the slowest step. 
This is the step that the rate is most dependent on. So let's look a little bit more in detail at the rate determining step, the slowest step in a chemical reaction, and the rate equation. Now, as we've already mentioned, the rate equation is based on this rate determining step. And the rate equation tells us how many particles are colliding in the rate determining step. So for example, in a second order reaction, there are two particles colliding in the rate determining step. Whilst in a third order reaction, there must be three particles colliding. Now, first order reactions only have one particle in the rate determining step. So here are some examples of rate equations and the rate determining step. So if the rate was equal to K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B, this is an overall second order reaction. So we could write the following rate determining step. A plus B goes to products. Now if we had a rate equation that was rate equal to K times the concentration of A, this is a first order reaction. And therefore, only one particle must be in the rate determining step. So we could write an equation for the rate determining step that would be as follows. A goes to just products. Now in our third example here, we have rate equal to K times the concentration of A raised to the power 2 times the concentration of B. Now, this equation shows that the rate is second order with respect to the concentration of A and first order with respect to the concentration of B. So overall, it's third order. And you can see, if I write an equation for the rate determining step, I have a total of three particles reacting in this step. Two of them would be A, because A is second order, and one of them would be reactant B. So my rate determining step could be written as 2A plus B goes to products. So now let's test your understanding of this with a practice question. So read through the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answers. Now this question asks you to write equations to represent the rate determining steps of the chemical reactions that have the following rate equations. So question 1a has a rate equation rate equals to k times a concentration of C2H4 times a concentration of Br2. So therefore, because it's second order overall and involves two particles reacting in the rate determining step, we could write the following equation. C2H4 plus Br2 goes to products. Now for B, rate is equal to K times a concentration of iodopropane. So we can write an equation C3H7I goes to products because it's first order. Now for C, its rate is equal to K times a concentration of NO to the power 2. So therefore we have 2NO go into products in the rate determining step. Now the rate equation for D shows us that it's third order overall and rate is equal to K times the concentration of H2O2 times the concentration of I minus times the concentration of H plus. So there's three particles colliding in the rate determining step. So it would be H2O2 plus I minus plus H plus goes to form products. Now kinetics can be used as evidence to support a proposed reaction mechanism. Now for example, from the rate equation, we can work out what reactants take part in the rate determining step. And if a proposed mechanism does not have a step with these reactants in, then it cannot be a correct mechanism. Now we can illustrate this by looking at a reaction we've seen previously in organic chemistry and that's the reaction of a halogenoalkane with sodium hydroxide. So I'm drawing chloroethane here, which is C2H5Cl. And if I react this with sodium hydroxide, 
and I would do this by refluxing the haloalkane with aqueous sodium hydroxide. I would get an alcohol, ethanol, C2H5OH, and NaCl. Now, this reaction is an example of a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And if I draw the reaction mechanism here, I would have C2H5Cl and the carbon chlorine bond has a dipole. The carbon is delta plus, the chlorine is delta minus, and this is because the chlorine is more electronegative than the carbon. And the nucleophile, OH minus, attacks the delta plus carbon, and this causes the carbon halogen bond to break. Now I'm left with my alcohol, the OH has swapped with the Cl. So I've got ethanol and Cl minus. Now kinetics backs up this mechanism. It provides the evidence that this mechanism is correct because kinetic studies have shown that rate for this reaction is equal to K times the concentration of the halogenoalkane times the concentration of OH minus ions. It's overall second order. So this means that the rate determining step must involve an OH minus ion and one halogenoalkane molecule. And this mechanism has a step involving one OH minus ion and one halogenoalkane molecule. So this is evidence that this mechanism is correct. If we'd have drawn a mechanism for this reaction that didn't have one halogenoalkane molecule reacting with one OH minus ion in one of its steps, then this mechanism wouldn't be correct. But this mechanism we've drawn has this one halogenoalkane molecule reacting with one OH minus ion. And it's this step here where the OH minus ion attacks the halogenoalkane, which is the rate determining step, the step which is the slowest step in the reaction and the one that the rate equation is based on. Now you may remember from organic chemistry that the mechanism that I've just drawn is for the reaction of a primary halogenoalkane with a nucleophile such as sodium hydroxide. Now if we have a tertiary halogenoalkane, where there are three alkyl groups attached to the carbon next to the halogen, a different mechanism exists. And we know this from kinetics. So I'm now going to draw a tertiary halogenoalkane. And the tertiary halogenoalkane that I'm going to draw, which has three alkyl groups on the carbon next to the halogen is going to be 2-chloro-2-methyl-propane. Now, if I react 2-chloro-2-methyl-propane with sodium hydroxide, I'm going to form an alcohol and sodium chloride. Now this reaction looks very similar to the reaction that occurs with a primary halogenoalkane and sodium hydroxide. However, kinetics shows us that it occurs by a completely different mechanism. Now, kinetic studies show that the rate is equal to K times the concentration of halogenoalkane. 
and it's first order overall, not second order. So the fact that we have a different rate equation tells us that the rate determining step only involves a halogenoalkane, doesn't involve the nucleophile OH-. So therefore, it must occur by a different mechanism. Now when tertiary halogenoalkanes react with sodium hydroxide, the rate determining step only involves the halogenoalkane. And what happens is that the halogenoalkane breaks up to form a carbocation and a chloride ion, and then the nucleophile attacks the carbocation. So it's a completely different mechanism for a tertiary halogenoalkane compared to a primary halogenoalkane. And that's why the rate equations are different for the two reactions. So to test your understanding of kinetics and the rate determining step, we're going to have a go to practice question. And this practice question comes in three parts. And the first two parts are on this slide. So read for the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answers to parts one and two, and then we'll look at part three. So this question is about a decomposition reaction involving dinitrogen pentoxide, N2O5, and its decomposition into nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. And it gives you a table of initial rates for this reaction at different concentrations of N2O5. And the first part of the question is asking you to show that the rate equation is consistent with the data above. And the rate equation is given as rate is equal to K times a concentration of N2O5. And it's an overall first order reaction. So to prove this, let's look at the table. So when we double the concentration of N2O5, the rate changes from 3 times 10 to the minus 5 to 6 times 10 to the minus 5, so the rate doubles. So if you double the concentration, the rate doubles, and that means it's a first order relationship, and that is exactly what the rate equation is indicating, so that proves that the rate equation is correct. So if you said that if you double the concentration, the rate doubles, therefore it's first order, you get a mark for that. Now for part two, it's asking you to calculate the value of the rate constant under these conditions. So if you're going to calculate the rate constant, you need to use the values from the table. Now, rate is equal to K times the concentration of N2O5. It's a first order reaction. So to work out the value of K, all I need to do is substitute in the data from the table into this rate equation. And I can use any rows in this table. So I'm going to use the top row. And the top row has an initial rate of 3.00 times 10 to the minus 5, when the concentration is 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3. So I'm going to substitute in those values for rate and concentration. So 3 times 10 to the minus 5 is equal to K times the concentration of N2O5, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 3. And if I rearrange this to get K, I have 3.00 times 10 to the minus 5 divided by 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3. And that gives me a value of K, which is equal to 7.50 times 10 to the minus 3. And I've written it as 7.50 times 10 to the minus 3 because it asked me to give my answer to three significant figures. Now I also have to state the units of K here. So I rearranged this equation that K was equal to rate in moles per decimeter cubed seconds to minus 1 over the concentration of N2O5, which is in moles per decimeter cubed. So if I put this now as an equation... I can cancel out the moles per decimeter cube because they occur on the top and the bottom, and that will leave me with units for k of seconds to the minus 1. 
So there's three marks for this question. You get one mark if you realize that to get k, you need to take a value for rate, such as 3 times 10 to the minus 5, and divide it by the concentration of N2O5. You get one mark for correctly expressing the value of K to three significant figures, and one mark for the correct units, seconds to the minus one. So here's the final part of this question. So read through the question, pause the video, have a go at it, and then we'll go for the answer. So this question gives you the rate equation. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of N2O5, and it's a first order reaction. And it draws two possible mechanisms, and it's asking you to state which of the mechanisms is compatible with the rate equation. Is it mechanism A or mechanism B? And it's a two mark question. Now the rate equation tells us that it's first order with respect to N2O5, and first order overall. So there's only one molecule involved in the rate determining step. Now if I look at the two mechanisms A and B, only A has a step where there's only one molecule of N2O5 as a reactant. And that's the first step of mechanism A. So if you said the rate determinist step must have one N2O5 molecule as a reactant, you get one mark. And if you said that it's mechanism A that matches this rate equation, you get the second mark. Now they'd also accept the reverse argument if you explain why it couldn't be mechanism B. So this is a two mark question. One mark if you said the rate determinist step must have one N2O5 molecule as reactant, and one mark for the idea that mechanism A matches this rate equation because it contains that step. So that concludes this video lesson. So after watching this video, you should now be able to explain the meaning of the term rate determining step and understand how kinetics data can be used as evidence to support proposed reaction mechanisms. You should also be able to understand that catalysts increase the rate of a reaction by providing alternative routes, or mechanisms with lower activation energies and be able to explain this using the Arrhenius equation. So that concludes this video lesson. So please check out our YouTube channel, Dr. O Chemistry, which has lots of GCSE, AS and A-level videos and our Twitter site, at Radochemistry.